step into the Yerapali Formation, a Middle Triassic time capsule along India's Pranhita, Godavari Basin. First distinguished in the 60s when Jane and colleagues unveiled a new vertebrate fauna from these red mudstones, Yerapali quickly became a keystone for piecing together Gondwana's prehistory. Here, a broad floodplain crossed by seasonal, ephemeral streams under a hot, semi-arid climate quietly buried the stories of fish, amphibians, and early reptiles in mudstone and caliche. Its cast includes long-necked alicotosaur, rhynchosaur, dicynodonts and elegant ave metatarsalian, an early cousin on the bird line. Because this fauna correlates with the famed Synognathus assemblage zone and mirrors Tanzania's Manda formation, Yerapali anchors global Triassic timelines and maps how life dispersed across a connected Gondwana. As the camera glides over those ochre beds, imagine floodplains buzzing with reptiles and amphibians, droughts broken by seasonal rains, and the first tentative steps of the dinosaur lineage already underway. Paradisuchus is a Capitosaurian temnus bundle, part of the mastodon saurid line within Stereospondyli, its current name fixed in 1968 after the earlier Paradisaurus proved preoccupied by a skink. Long and low-skulled with upward-set eyes and heavy dermal ornament, it bears lateral-line sensory grooves across the skull roof, slit-like coenae on the palate, and palatal fangs suited to gripping slick prey. At roughly three meters in length, it likely swam with sinuous trunk and tail undulations, as in many stereospondyls, integument probably ranged from small dermal scales to reduced scalation, and direct skin evidence is sparse. Ecologically it occupied a crocodile-like ambush niche, taking fishes and small tetrapods with a powerful bite likely complemented by suction during rapid mouth opening, feeding strategies documented in closely related stereospondyls. Graceful and low slum, Yerasuchus is an aphanosaur, among the earliest ave metatarsalians on the bird line, showing that this lineage began as quadrupeds with a surprisingly crocodile normal ankle. Elongated cervical vertebrae gave it a poised, far-reaching neck ahead of a lightly built trunk and slim limbs, for a body plan of roughly 2 meters optimized for quick, ground-level maneuvering. Its own jaws are scantily known, but the recurved teeth and bone histology of its close relative teleocrator indicate a small carnivore with growth rates nearer to other birdline archosaurs than to crocodile line forms. It likely functioned as a nimble terrestrial hunter, picking off small vertebrates along open flats and channel margins with reach and speed rather than brute force. Pamelaria belongs to Allocotosauria, a non-archosaurian branch of early archosauromorphs, once lumped with proterosaurs but now placed near the base of this clade's radiation. Its outline is distinctive, a low, wide trunk borne on near-equal fore and hind limbs in a sprawl, a periscope-like neck built from six stout cervicals, and a small, tapering skull with the nostrils right at the snout's tip. Vertebral joint geometry indicates the neck flexed mainly up and down at the base and swept laterally nearer the head, probably counterbalanced by a deep, heavy tail. Fine, conical teeth point to a primarily insectivorous forager, an interpretation consistent with invertebrate trace fossils preserved in the same floodplain system. Broad-jawed and power-built, Baratilosuchus is an erythrosuchid archosauriform, one of the large-headed, hypercarnivorous predators that sit near the base of the archosaur stem. Its known skeleton indicates a quadruped about 2.3 m long with the deep-skulled profile typical of the family. Phylogenetically it clusters with Shansisicus and Kalashivia, hinting at a broad Pangaean spread of erythrosuchids laid in the clade's history. Ecologically, think top-tier ground hunter a muscular, short-necked macropredator using a powerful shear and grip bite to subdue sizable vertebrates within Triassic River Plain food webs. Rechnosaurus is a Canamyriform dicynodont, 
and herbivorous anomodont on the synapsid line, first placed among stalacheriids but later treated as in setes because the known material is incomplete. Its skull, about 38 centimeters long, bears a sharp median nasal ridge flanked by deep fossae, a blunt-beaked snout, and robust caniniform tusks set on a rugose flange, a low boss sits just behind the pineal foramen. The coarse sculpturing of the snout strongly suggests a heavy keratin covering and visual display, and comparisons within Dicinodonts now even include rare mummified skin impressions in Lystrosaurus indicating dimpled, leathery integument rather than dense fur. Ecologically, picture a sturdy, low-browsing herbivore cropping tough floodplain plants with its keratinous beak while its nasal crest and facial bosses doubled as signals in social encounters. Wadiosaurus is a Canemyriform dicynodont, its deep, triangular skull and keratinous beak framed by thick maxillary flanges, tusked in some individuals, features Bundyopadyai interpreted as sexually dimorphic display structures. Postcranial work depicts a graviportal, semi-erect quadruped with powerful forelimbs and elevated hips, built to carry a disproportionately large head without sacrificing steady, energy-efficient locomotion. Its bones record a rapid early growth strategy. Fibrolamellar tissues and a three-stage ontogenetic pattern show fast juvenile accrual followed by environmentally modulated slowdowns, life written to the beat of a seasonal floodplain. Most evocative is its social footprint, a single site preserving at least 23 individuals, many juveniles, captures a herd mired in mud, consistent with the hypothesis that females aggregated while males ranged more solitarily. Horned and herbivorous, Shringosaurus sits within a Zendosauridae, its paired supraorbital horns dimorphic and best explained as products of sexual selection. Envision 4 meters, deep-bodied quadruped with a compact, boxy skull, confluent external nares, and a relatively short yet powerfully braced neck supported by unusually tall cervical and anterior dorsal neural spines. Its teeth are low, leaf-shaped and coarsely serrated, complemented by equally developed palatal teeth, an apparatus suited to robust browsing and convergent in some ways with early sauropodomorph feeders. The horn cores show grooves and rugosities indicating a keratin sheath, and large individuals fuse multiple skull roof bones, signals of headgear built for forceful intrasexual contests. Taphonomy strengthens the picture of a social browser, a monotaxic bone bed preserving multiple age classes, plausibly a herd assembled at dwindling water and overtaken by crevasse splay floods. Welcome to the Tiki Formation, a late Triassic red bed world named for the village of Tiki in Madhya Pradesh, in India. These mudstones and sandstones span the Carnian to Norian and correlate with South America's famed Esquigualasto, making Tiki a cornerstone for comparing Gondwanan ecosystems. Its headline fossils include Tikasuchus, the first Rauasuchid ever reported from Asia, plus crocodile like phytosaurs and beaked rhynchosaurs. Geologically, Tiki preserves a monsoonal floodplain of rivers, ephemeral ponds, and calcretti-studded soils whose seasonal pulses concentrated sprawling bone beds. In this landscape, giant amphibians wallowed, archosaurs thrived, cynodonts, the close cousins of early mammals, scurried, and even indeterminate dinosaur remains hint that dinosaurs were beginning to join the scene. And like any good mystery, Tiki keeps scientists honest, a jaw once hailed as the earliest lizard now appears to be a much younger intruder, while fresh microcoprolites and trace fossils continue to sharpen this immersive portrait of a world brimming with life.
A spiny-finned hybodont in the family Lonchididae, Lonchidion belongs to a shark-grade lineage that spans the Middle Triassic to the latest Cretaceous and was erected by Richard Estes in 1964, though some authors have folded it into Lycidas. Although mostly known from teeth, exceptional Las Hoyas material preserves a around 3.5 cm subadult, among the tiniest elasmobranchs, hinting at a slender, torpedo-bodied fish with modest dorsal spines. Its low-crowned, laterally extended teeth and mild heterodonty, slicers up front, crushers behind, mark a durophagus feeder built to crack small, hard-shelled prey. Ecologically it reads as a nimble, urahaline mesopredator frequenting fresh to brackish waters, with paleoxerous egg capsules and swarms of juvenile teeth at classic nursery sites pointing to spawning in shallow lakes and deltas. A thin-spined tenacanthid, Cladidus sits among early elasmobranchs with classic cladodont dentitions, and modern revisions restrict the name to a well-defined, fish-snaring form rather than a wastebasket for look-alike teeth. Picture a lean shark with a heterocircle tail and ornamented dorsal fin spines, in its jaws, a tall spear-like median cusp flanked by smaller accessory cusps, an arrangement built to see slippery prey. Biomechanically, those multicusped teeth functioned like barbed tongs, excelling at puncturing and drawing prey toward the throat rather than slicing it into pieces. Ecologically it reads as a swift shelf sea hunter cruising through schools of fishes and cephalopods, occupying a mid-tier predatory niche beneath larger apex forms. A true lungfish, Natheriza belongs to the dipnoan family Natherhizidae, Phylogenetic work places it among basal post-Devonian lungfishes, and the lineage persists into the early Triassic. In life, imagine a compact, sinuous fish with paddle-like paired fins and heavy tooth plates, sometimes showing petrodentine, its stout tail built for leverage. Its calling card is estivation, bottle-shaped burrows record how it excavated with the mouth and then waded out drought's tail down, a behavior captured exquisitely in Permian paleosols. Ecologically it was a resilient benthic forager, urahaline across late Paleozoic fresh, brackish, and marine settings, yet Triassic occurrences show a shift to strictly freshwater as more derived lungfishes took over. Threading the wetlands margins, the small amphibian guild, from discoglossid-like frogs such as Eodiscoglossus to juvenile chigutosaurids like Compsocerops, patrolled leaf-choked shallows, gleaning invertebrates with quick snaps and retreating to oxbows and root tangles as monsoonal waters rose and fell. Metapasaurus belongs to Metapasauridae, with diagnoses historically hinging on the course of the lacrimal bone, a character now treated cautiously after detailed revisions. Picture a broad, pancake-flat skull with dorsally placed eyes and richly ornamented dermal bone, behind the tusked palate, the maxilla alone bears roughly 80, 100-plus small recurved teeth, a conveyor built for gripping. Biomechanical testing points to a grab and suction feeding style, ideal for snatching fishes and small tetrapods from turbid shallows. Postcranial anatomy suggests swimming by near-synchronous, flipper-like limb strokes, with a relatively stiff trunk acting as a stable core, more rowing amphibian than undulating eel. Bone histology records thick seasonal growth bands, and independent evidence indicates head and forelimb burrowing as waters dwindled during dry spells. When lakes contracted, these giants could mass in shrinking pools, leaving dense mortality horizons that track their role as dominant ambush predators on seasonal floodplains. As the wetlands deepen into broad, shifting channels, the spotlight swings to the Archosaur Titans, Colossosuchus, Vulcanosuchus and Tikisuchus, apex actors whose riverbank ambushes and landward pursuits recalibrated every heartbeat of the floodplain. Among phytosaurs, 
Parasuchus sits near the base of the tree, its once tangled identity, born from a chimeric type mixing phytosaur and rhynchosaur elements, clarified by the designation of a neotype and subsequent phylogenetic work. In life you'd meet a low slung, crocodile-shaped hunter with a long, laterally compressed snout, external nares set high and close to the eyes, and a back armored by paired rows of osteoderms. Its feeding scope was broad, spectacular gut contents reveal whole Malarosaurus skeletons inside Parasuchus, undercutting the old notion of a strictly fish-eating phytosaur. Everything about its build speaks to a semi-aquatic ambush style along turbid channels and oxbows. Taxonomically, modern analyses often fold the classic Paleorhinus grade into Parasuchus by priority, recovering Hislopi with Bransoni and Angustifrons as an early, informative clade for understanding phytosaur evolution. A hyperodipedon team rhynchosaur, hyperodapidon embodies the stocky, beaked herbivore whose sheer abundance defines the classic hyperodapidon assemblage zone used to pin down carnian aged ecosystems. Its jaw apparatus is a showpiece of specialization, parallel carpets of maxillary tooth plates split by a longitudinal groove that receives a single mandibular row, engineered for a tight, precision shear bite. Tooth wear and joint kinematics argue for cropping and mincing tough plants, while a keratin-sheathed, sensory-rich premaxilla hints it could also probe soft sediments for buried morsels. On the floodplain it functioned as the dominant bulk browser, a primary consumer that reshaped vegetation and anchored food webs wherever it thrived. And when the waterholes drew hunters, bite marks skulls and jaws testify that phytosaurs and other carnivores sometimes turned this powerhouse of plant processing into prey. A small sphenodontion on the Tuatara line, Clevisaurus represents an early rhynchocephalian radiation of nimble, short-snout insect eaters with several closely related species. Its jaws carried precisely occluding, self-sharpening tooth batteries, blade-like and wear-faceted in European forms, while other species such as Brasiliensis show more conical dentary teeth and distinct dentary morphology. Biomechanical modeling indicates bite forces and tooth pressures high enough to crush thick-shelled beetles, pointing to a versatile, hard prey diet. Endocast data reveal a relatively low encephalization quotient, yet in life it was a quick, ground-foraging mesopredator that neatly filled the small vertebrate niche between arthropods and their hunters. A dromatheriid cynodont on the mammalian stem, Rewakonodon nests among early prosostrodontians, two named species are recognized, Tychiensis and Indicus, the latter diagnosed by tri- to tetracuspid sectorial crowns with singular accessory cusps and a marked constriction at the crown, root junction. Its post-canines mirror classic dromatheriid design, labiolingually flattened, single-rooted teeth bearing a narrow, symmetrical row of sharp cusps, while longitudinal root furrows hint at the evolutionary step toward the two-rooted condition of mammaliaforms. Such cutlery favors precise shearing rather than grinding, fitting a small faunivore capable of dispatching chitinous insects and other tiny vertebrates with swift, scissor-like bites. Within the floodplain web, it likely filled the nimble, low-tier predator slot, elusive among leaf shadow and bank debris, yet opportunistic enough to tap resources untouched by bulk browsers and the larger Arcosaur hunters.